Ma, no, no, I need more energy than that. It's Monday. You can't be that tired. Oh, Lord. Everybody had a good weekend? Restful? Yes. Mm -hmm. um, okay. So that means you are ready to work. Yes, ma'am. Okay. All right. So let's do chapter two and chapter three tonight. Um, the midterm will be on. I just get the book. What are you talking about now? What that's supposed to mean? <laughs> <laughs> you know, Monday coming is a holiday, correct? Yes, that's right. Right. Okay. So that's why I'm doing two on three and then four on Wednesday because Monday is a holiday. So midterm is July the 21st. And the final is August the 18th. Midterm is online or in? In class. That's a Saturday? No, that's a Wednesday. Oh Lord. <laughs> Don't forget now we're in class every Wednesday, you know. So okay. the midterm is on July the 21st, six to nine. And the finals is on the 18th. Okay. 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 All right. So chapter two is about the legal system, which we more or less touched on in the last class when we went over the laws, but what you have to try to get a concept of is you have to understand, you have to take away more or less your definition, which you've known all along of what law is and why we need it and begin to understand the concept of law. Um, how many of you have read, read any, uh, any law case at all? Any of them? Anyone read a law case? Yes. Okay, so you've read. Doris, anybody else? No? No, ma'am. Okay, so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna send you tonight. I don't need you to read it now. This to be read like every weekend, you can start to read it because we're gonna discuss it when we get to that chapter. So, it's a Bahamian case. It was a recent ruling. It involves Scotia Bank and a client. And we're going to get to that topic after the, after the midterm. But you get, you'll have it and you would have already read it by the time we get to the chapter. So in your notes, it says, what is law? What it is really is just a set of rules that administer and, in, and, in, and is enforced by the state. Mm -hmm. You know that they're enacted by Parliament, because you'll see when when um, new laws Happy go to the, when new laws um, are being passed, you'll see them say there is a bill, and then that bill is read, corrections are made, read again, reviewed, and then it's passed, and then it goes to the Senate, and then it goes to the Governor General for assent. So really the purpose of law is to govern the actions of not just people, but also companies in a society. And of course, when you don't abide by the law, there are penalties. Penalties could be fines or penalties could be imprisonment. So, hold on. That's that's what that's Miguel. We have salt going in. This is mushroom seasoning. I'm gonna do half a tablespoon of this. That's someone's iPhone. That's not us. Okay, let's see. That's someone on our call, or yeah, whoever is using the iPhone. Yeah, that's us. Okay, let's see. That's someone on our call, or yeah, whoever is using the iPhone. I don't know who's using the iPhone. Somebody. It's still coming on again.
the really the purpose of law is to regulate the duties of every individual. Is really to 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 make sure that everybody is doing what they're supposed to do. So it's more or less meant to control individuals for the interests of the majority. Now, if we were in class, now this would have opened up in a whole big debate, looking at our laws and whether it actually controls individuals in, in the society today, based upon the amount of crime that we have. Is it, is it the laws that need to be changed or is it the individuals themselves, which turns to morality, whether or not they know right from wrong, whether or not they have that Christian upbringing, or is it that the laws themselves are archaic and need to be changed? And saying that means that the punishment needs to be stiffer. Some people believe that punishment does not really deter people from crime. What are your views? What do you think? You think if we increase punishment, we'll have less crime? I believe that. You believe that? Yes. So you believe that we don't hang right now, that we should hang there? Because that's what's missing from our books. I, or should I, we start cutting off the hands? Whoop. Cutting off person's hands. Mm. If you steal, cut off the hand. Mm -hmm. You think that will deter deter crime? I think it would. But if you go, if you look in other other countries that cut off the hand, they still have crime. They still have crime, but they still have crime. Maybe not to the level that we have, but mm -hmm. they still have crime. So you look at if you look at at Muslim countries, when someone commit a wrong. They have such punishment as you are stoned to death. Yeah. Which is very cruel. Is that a proper way for someone to die? No. You just shoot them in the head. Oh, Lord. <laughs> what is this? Okay. So, so, so if we are to argue that the purpose of having laws in this country, in any country, is to control individuals, do you think that the laws that we currently have on the books, are they controlling individuals? Mm. It's the question to ask, right? Uh, yeah, I mean, I feel like, I don't know, some of our laws don't appear to be enforced. But for people who murder, like, it seems as if murders are going, you know, unabated. The same people in and out of jail, they're out on bail, committing more murders. I don't know, it seems to be a problem with the courts, eh? getting to these cases in a, in a quicker manner, and then the cases are not strong enough, you know, as, you know, to, 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 to um, get a conviction. So, I mean, we got, we got a lot of issues because a lot of people, they may know something about the case, but they don't want to get involved because of, you know, fair reprisals, you know. So we, uh -huh. we have a lot of issues, man. We have a lot of issues. But are our, but our, our issues unique just to us or to all countries? You see, you see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. Because we're not the only country with these issues. Mm -hmm. Every country has laws and every country has the laws? same challenge. Same challenge. Go ahead. Go ahead. Do you think our laws are so antiquated that um, they need to be revisited sincerely in order for them to work? Because I think that's one of the issues um, like she says, the timeline in which they address them. But as for like in banking, if mm -hmm. they wait till something happened, they wait till the cats are the bag, then they come behind and say, oh, we, you need to do this. It's same with, um, with the um, compliance part. They didn't come up with um, having to have compliance officers or whatever in banks until after something serious happened. So do you think we are reactive rather than pro um, proactive? And that's what causes some of our issues? Yes, yes. yes. Um, um, if, I, if, if I would personally look at this whole situation, um, I would say we should have dealt with education a very long time ago. Mm -hmm. 
from the from the beginning from the 1970s as soon as that drug um crisis started and people started dying families were left without fathers left without mothers or both and we saw people not going to school people coming out of school not being able to read and write we should have gotten serious and that's how crime escalates because if you if you speak to some of these people one they cannot rationalize two they have no interest in what's happening in the country all they want to know is i need money and i'm going to get it and who's going to stop me and if i spend some time so what their mentality is totally different from other people not saying that educated persons don't commit crime not saying that but we would have had a better society if we had learned how to control these individuals by taking charge of their lives and i agree with you some of the legislation themselves need to be changed but change for legislation comes from activism from the public if you're going to leave it to the lawmakers and parliament it will always be reactive but if you want a change you have to lobby for that change and lobbying for that change means that you're going to have the form bodies who are going to consistently consistently put pressure on the government to make changes now once in a while you may hear something happen a little pocket of people come like the marco archer law they keep that going and they have the other one what's that other one something against women i think there's an activist group for that but but until an event happens you don't hear from these groups they're supposed to stay in the forefront they're supposed to be out there researching different laws or asking young um law students or asking the bar um the Eugene Dupuy Law School and 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 university to look at different legislation let's see what we need to change to try to to help our society but our mindset is not there So yes our laws are behind yes there's no one really working on it if they are by the time they finish things have moved on into something else So in the Bahamas our legal system is based on rules and as a former colony our laws came from England and over time it has developed based upon cases that were that were being judged here in the Bahamas So we have three primary types of law when you go when you look at it we have public law and public law deals with administrative law you have private law and that has to do with organizations such as like banking law that's private you have criminal law which we all know it's always in the papers robbery armed robbery and then you have civil law and civil law deals with matters related to individuals contract law personal injury or tort which means as is a negligent act against someone else so legislation is law it is made by parliament like i said and is found in the acts of parliament legislation itself has three main purposes we already said is to regulate and control society but legislation is also to raise taxes raise taxes so that the government could finance its fiscal policies and of course the role of legislation is to create new legislation repeal which means get rid of revise make amendments or reform the law making changes based on what's happening in society so when you talk about bohemian law and where bohemian law came from is a culmination of different things one our supreme law in the bahamas is the constitution that gives you all of your rights of course english common law because we are 
a Commonwealth jurisdiction, a former colony of the United Kingdom. Bahamian case law is our source of law also. And Bahamian legislation, the primary legislation, which are the acts, and the subsidiary, which are the regulations. Our source of laws also by custom, how we do things. How we do things is interpreted when the judges have a matter before them. Our source of law is also international treaties that are signed by different ministers and ministries, like the Minister of Labor, or you have um, international treaties that are signed by foreign affairs. And we also have regional treaties with the Caribbean countries, CARICOM. And last but not least, our source of Bahamian law is equity. And equity means what is fair. So when a judge looks at a decision, he makes a decision, he would balance out what is fair to both parties. So Bahamas being a former colony and a member of the Commonwealth, it follows what we call common law or case law. And that is a source of law for the judges when they're reviewing matters. And it all goes back to our colonialization. So central to the whole common law as a legal source is the doctrine of precedent or what we call stare decisis. Precedence means that when you look at our judicial system, decisions that are made by the court higher than the court that is actually hearing the matter are binding on the lower courts. So when you look at our court system at the very bottom, who's at the bottom of our court system? Anyone knows? What's the lowest court in the Bahamas? The magistrate court. The magistrate court. And after the, the magistrate, magistrate court, court. Right. After the magistrate court is who? The Supreme Court. Supreme Court. Now the Supreme. Um, the Court of Appeal. Uh-huh. And then you have? And then we have the Privy Court. The Privy Council. Okay. Privy Council. Yeah, the Privy Council. Right. Okay. So that's what we call the judicature of the Bahamas. That's our court system. So a matter that is a judge in the Supreme Court is binding on the magistrate court. A matter that is ruled in the Court of Appeal is binding on the Supreme Court and the magistrate court. A matter that is ruled in the Privy Council is binding on the Court of Appeal, the Supreme Court, and the magistrate's court. So when you talk about judicial precedents, there are two types, binding and persuasive. So when I just spoke about the decisions being made by the higher court and our judicature, those are binding on the lower courts, which means they have to follow the decision that the judges made in the higher court above them. Persuasive are judgments that were made in other courts. And what they do is they use them for guidance. So when you read a legal matter, you will see where they refer to an English case, or they may refer to a case that's done in Trinidad. They may do one that's referred to in the United States, or in Canada, or in Nigeria, any Commonwealth country. And those become persuasive. Which means that the laws are not exactly the same, but they will lend the judge or give the judge more guidance as to how he should try and come to a decision or a conclusion that is fair and equitable to the parties. So I know there's been a lot of argument and a lot of talk every time there's a decision from the Privy Council that we should get rid of those persons and probably join the Caribbean Court of Justice. And every time there is a discussion, of course, it is for a couple of days, maybe a week, and then it just dies down and you hear about it no more again. So the degree of persuasiveness of a precedent will depend on a variety of factors, 
and which includes the jurisdiction from which it emanates, the state of the court which makes a decision, and the date of it. Remember, one of the sources of law, not just in the Bahamas, but in other jurisdictions, is custom. So the laws in another, another Commonwealth country may be similar to ours, but the court in that jurisdiction takes in the custom, what is happening in the country at that time. And their decision may be based on that, on those factors. Whereas in the Bahamas, those factors may not be taking place. So that's why it's always when you read a case, it's very good always to read what we call obita dicta. Obita dicta means that you're reading all the background information as to how the judge came up with his decision. Now, in addition to the magistrate court, what's the difference between the magistrate and the Supreme Court? I could take a guess. The Supreme Court, it has a jury and the magistrate court does not. No? Yes, and what else? Uh, uh, I don't know what else. <laughs> um, the magistrate court deals with I don't know. I know there's a five thousand dollars stipulation on, on cases, like they deal with a maximum of five thousand. Uh huh. Uh huh. Anything over us to go to the Supreme Court. Right. And what else? Oh, that's it for me. Okay. Anybody else? Nobody knows what else. The magistrate court. Don't you go to magistrate court for a lot of little small matters? They deal with a lot of criminal matters. Company title. What do you mean, company title? Mm -hmm. Did you mean when oh, you say company title? Property title. title. Oh, no property. property. Title? No, that go to Supreme Court. Oh. Mm -mm. Supreme Court hears civil, criminal, and constitutional cases. Oh, okay. Yeah. yeah, not the magistrate court. Now, in addition to the magistrate court, you also have family island administrators. And then you also have lay magistrates. Lay magistrates could be like justice of the peace. And they can hear matters and refer matters to other courts. So you need to read the, the section I have on the three courts just for your information. So you know the difference between them. And of course, the Court of Appeal hears matters that came from the Supreme Court or the Magistrate Court or the Tribunal Court. You know, you, you do know what the Tribunal Court is for, right? You heard about it, the Tribunal Court? Um, no? I'll okay. Employer, employee disputes? Or? Yes, yes. yes. Okay. It's called industrial tribunal. So okay. that's where you go for employment related issues. So any appeal from that goes to the court of appeal. Now, if there is something to do with the rules of the court, that matter may be referred to the Supreme Court. Okay. So you don't, and you know that we have court in New Providence and in Grand Bahama. Yes. So in addition to the magistrate court, the tribunal for employment, industrial tribunal, the Supreme Court, the Court of Appeal and the Privy Council. And of course, like I said, we have family island administrators. We also have lay magistrates. We also have specialized courts. And those specialized courts are the juvenile court mm. and the domestic court and the night court. Domestic court is where they go for child support. Night court is traffic court and for other small, small matters, small civil matters. So whenever you look at a legal case, you normally see a written opinion 
done either by the Supreme Court or the Industrial Tribunal, the Court of Appeal or the Privy Council. So the question always is asked like, how can you identify what's the legal principle in this case? Remember now, this is banking law. And in law, law is based on principles. That's why when you come to a decision in banking, the decision isn't what you feel or what you see people have always done. Behind everything that's done in banking is based on law. It's written somewhere in law. It's either, it's either a, a case that was decided a long time ago or it's now in legislation. So when you hear people call about, say things like the ratio de sedendi of a case, that means that you're looking at the reason why the judge made the decision. And that ratio is the legal reason. And he arrives at it based on three things. The judge's statement of the facts, on account of the way in which the decision was reached. And of course, the decision that he made in order to resolve the dispute between the parties. And when I send you this case tonight, if, you, if you're eager be when you start to read it tonight, for the first time, you may have to read it more than once, but it is quite long. You begin to see those same three things, where the judge tells you what are the facts of the case, He's going to tell you on account of the way in which he thinks the decision was reached. And then he's going to tell you how he's resolving the dispute. And the same way in which you see when you read that case is the way in which you're going to answer questions going forward. That is how you answer a legal question. Over the dicta is like what I said before. It means by the way. And that means that he's going to look at the facts and he's going to be talking about either what he sees is happening around him, but there's not material. Starry decisis means let the decision stand. The decision is what the decision is made. Now, there are instances where a judge can look at a precedent which being precedent means what? Another case. And he can actually distinguish that case. And when he distinguishes it, it means that yes, the facts are the same, but there are some slight differences between the two cases. So let's just say there was a matter before the Supreme Court and there was a matter before that was done by the Court of Appeals. The facts are almost mirror each other, except for, for some small peculiarities. What, what the court can then do is say, guess what? Yes, these two cases are practically the same. Yes, we should come to the same conclusion. However, these are the differences between the present case before us and the case that was decided by the higher court. And we will now distinguish why we cannot follow the decision that was made in the higher court. And that is called distinguishing the precedent. You have any questions? No? Well, I had a question. Um, let's say a, lo a lower court doesn't necessarily agree with a decision, a previous decision by the higher court, right? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I mean, and they decide to, I guess, build up, make their own case and go another way. Would that be the same as distinguishing finding um, president? So that would be something different. If they didn't agree with the decision. No, can no, disagree? no, no. You can't change your mind saying you don't agree. Okay. No, you can't say you don't agree. Remember now, in law, you have to follow precedents. Okay. So if there was a case that was the same as the case that they are presenting, mm -hmm. and they want to say, okay, let me give you an example of a case. 
So let's just say, in the Court of Appeal, there was a, a boy who stole, who robbed a bank. Um, he was accompanied by two other persons. There was a getaway car. It happened in the night. He was a high school student. Um, they were able to take X number of dollars. They spent some. He was a smart boy. Mm -hmm. He did it on his own. Now before, now before the Supreme Court now, they have a robbery done by an elderly gentleman. There was three people, but this one was planned because he had assistance from the persons working in the company. Mm. You see what I mean? Mm -hmm. So even though both are robberies, both are the same um, accomplices, both had a getaway car. Um, distinction could be one was day, one was night, but that's not that material. Mm -hmm. But if you're talking about one had in, 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 um, um, one had inside help and one didn't, it makes a big difference. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So then you would say, when you look at how the judge came to his decisions and he would have used cases that were in line with mm -hmm. how that whole robbery took place, then you would say, I'm distinguishing. Mm -hmm. You see? So you say, I will distinguish my case from that one. I cannot follow the decision that was made. Okay. But you can't just on your own mm -hmm. decide you could do what you feel like doing as a judge. It doesn't work that way. Okay. Everything is based on precedent. Okay. 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 Any other questions? No? All right, so you will find also when you read in certain cases, a judge has to decide what words mean. And whenever you're referring to a, um, a piece of legislation, any legislation that you read, to really know what that legislation is talking about, you don't know that until is tried in a court. So you could read any legislation, but to really know what that means and how that would impact either the company or the individual, it has to be tried in court. And how, what a judge does is when he's reading a legislation and he now has to apply that legislation to a matter that's before him, he has to use the rules of interpretation. Because in law, words have different meaning and they're based on rules. So the first rule is the literal rule. And the literal rule means that what the judge does is he tries to figure out what was the intention of parliament when they actually drafted that act itself. And if the words are capable in more than one meaning, the court will take that this is the meaning the court will take and that the statute will be enforced accordingly. Because remember, a word has more than one meaning. So normally what the judge does is he goes back to when that legislation was drafted, what was the intent at that point in time? He could take that same piece of legislation and he could say, I'm not applying the literal rule. I'm going to apply the golden rule. And this is normally done when the literal interpretation would actually produce an, an absurd or unwanted result. Or the statute says is capable of more than one meaning. And you will see that whenever there's a word being used, you'll see where the judge then comes and he tells you, this is what this word means. The definition that he gives is following one of these rules of interpretation. 
The next one is the mischief. The rule can be applied where the statute under consideration was to remedy a defect or mischief in the law, which means that the law itself was written to try to control the individuals. And the last one is the Eustom Generous Rule. And this applies when you read a legislation and it starts to list different items, more or less like giving you an example of what the law is referring to. So let's say if the law says under um, the Motor Vehicle Act or Road Traffic Act, let's say it says, and licensing will be applied at a rate of $100 for all vehicles such as, and then it lists three or four items. So what it's telling you is that if you have a mode of transportation that is not similar to the ones that is listed in, in that act right there, those three, whatever three um, items they gave you, then that is not, according to that section, that mode of transportation does not fall within the ambit of that section of the act. Any questions? I know it's getting real technical now. No questions. So how does a bill become an act? A bill itself is drafted either by the ministry first, or it can originate in the attorney general's office. If it originates in the ministry itself, based upon responses or actions that they see um, within their constituents, then they draft it first and then it goes to the AG's office. So say banks. Banks or trust companies or money service business or credit unions has the regulator. The same thing with the securities, they have a regulator. The regulator for banks and trusts or the regulator for securities, like we said last week, the Central Bank or the Securities Commission, if they see that there is a piece of legislation that needs to be revised, or they notice that there is a loophole in the legislation, or they um, attend conferences and realize that things are changing in the banking world or the securities world, then they will propose legislation or amendments. Those regulators will draft that legislation first. They will then send it out to the Attorney General's office for vetting. Comments then return to the regulator. That may happen two or three times over several months. When is at a point where the Attorney General's office and the regulator says, yes, this is what we want, then they send it out to the banks and trust companies or to the brokerage firms of his security and ask for their comments. Making sure, yes, we've written the law, but let's go out to our registrants to see if it is practical and whether or not it will actually address what we're trying to address. Because remember now, the regulators are not out there in the banking area. So they really need the practitioners to tell them whether what they are saying makes sense. Once they have the comments, they collate it, they make further changes, they may send it back out to a smaller group of registrants, then it goes to the Attorney General's office. Once the Attorney General's office and the regulator has looked at it and say, yes, this is what we want, then the minister that is responsible for that area makes, presents that bill to Parliament. When that bill goes to Parliament, it is introduced and the first reading takes place. The first reading is where the long title is read. And then the speaker orders the bill to be printed and the bill is numbered. 
Then you have the second reading, and that's where the bill is debated. All members of parliament speak on the bill. Then you have the committal stage. And in this, the entire house sits as a committee. The bill is examined clause by clause and any um, 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 ambiguities are clarified. And at the report stage, the bill is returned to parliament. Then you have a third reading. And a motion is made by the speaker to pass the bill. If the bill is supported by the majority, it is passed and then it goes to the Senate. When it goes to the Senate, it goes through the same process again. The long title is debated. They look, go clause by clause, look for any ambiguities. And then they have the third and the final reading. Once that's done by majority, the bill is passed. And then it's sent to the governor general for assent. Once the governor general assents to it, it is no longer a bill. It is now an act. And that act is published in the Gazette. And normally after publishing, sometimes the next day, sometimes as a month later, sometimes as months later, you will see where the effective date of the legislation is published in the Gazette. Any questions? So we did last week, we looked at different laws that apply to banking business. We looked at the regulators legislation, the Banks and Trust Companies Regulations Act. We also looked at the Banks and Trust, the, the, the Central Bank of the Bahamas Act and the Banks and Trust Companies Regulations Act. We know that the Central Bank Act regulates the central bank itself. And we know that the Banks and Trust Companies Regulation Act regulates banks, trusts, credit unions, money transfer business, private trust companies. We also know that in addition to the Banks and Trust Companies Regulations Act, we also know that all banks and all other entities that do business in the Bahamas have to comply with the anti-money laundering framework, which includes the Proceeds of Crime Act, the Financial Transaction Reporting Act and its regulations, the financial transaction wire transfer regulations, the anti-terrorism act. We also know they have to comply with the Financial Intelligence Unit Act. We know that because we, in this digital world, we also have to look at the Payment Systems Act. Because everything is electronic again, and we do have clients' information, and that also involves any other entity that has client information. You have to keep it confidential. We have the Data Protection Act. Again, because we're moving into the electronic world in the 21st century, we have legislation that covers data breaches, computer misuse, and the penalties that are quite stiff that goes with such misuse of the computer. So if we, when we look at banking and we look at all those legislation, and then we look a few minutes ago at law and where the, where the law came from and why there is law. So with those two introductory lessons, we're now going to start to make that pathway to really understand what is banking law. And before you can actually look at any banking law case, you have to know contract law. Like I said to you last class, 
everything that deal with banking is premised on contract law. Everything that you do in banking is based on a contract that a client has signed with the bank. So in your mind, you have to know what is contract law. And we're gonna go through it tonight just in terms of principles. And next class on Wednesday, we're gonna do the fourth chapter, but we're also gonna start to look at some general contract questions. And then we'll look at some banking questions. So you can get an idea of how this contract law applies to banking. So as you all know, a contract is a legally enforceable agreement and it gives rise to obligations on both sides. So under contract, the parties, they voluntarily assume their obligations or undertakings. So you are an employee. As an employee, you have a contract. In that contract, you have obligations and the employer has obligations. You will learn in contract law that you have express clauses and you have implied clauses. And the implied ones are the ones that come from common law, case law. So in contract law, there is no legal duty to enter into an agreement. But if the parties choose to, then legal obligations will arise. So if you want to say that you are in a valid contract, there are what we call the essential elements of a contract. For there to be a valid contract, someone has to make an offer and someone has to accept that offer. So there must be an offer and there must be acceptance. But in addition to offer and acceptance, there must be consideration. You cannot have a contract unless there is consideration. And consideration means two things. Either there's cash involved or someone is going to actually carry out an act. So to have a contract, you need an offer, you need acceptance, you need consideration, but you also need to have the intention to create legal relations, which means that the parties must want to enter into a contract. And last but not least, the parties to the contract must have legal capacity, which means they must be able to enter into that contract legally. And the legal age, is 18, though you will find out later that there are circumstances where someone who is under the age of 18 can enter into a legally binding contract. So in addition to the five basic elements to have a valid contract, there are other things that you have to consider. One, you have to look at the required form for the contract. Certain contractual arrangement must be in writing by law. One of those is property. Whenever you are purchasing a property, that agreement must be in writing, starting from the agreement for sale, then to the conveyance. And then if you go to the bank for a loan, a mortgage. Second thing you have to consider in addition to the five elements is that your contract has to be for something legal. You cannot enter into a contract to buy marijuana because right now it is illegal in the Bahamas or even to buy any cocaine or any one of those things. There must be genuineness of consent to the terms of the contract, 
which means that one party can't influence another party, nor can they misrepresent the either, one of the other parties. The contract itself has to be enforceable by law, which means that you could stand before the courts and either party can argue their rights or their obligations to the contract. The terms of the contract should be included, and that speaks about the responsibilities of the parties or their duties, their obligation, or just the nature of what the contract is all about. In most contracts, it also speaks to how the contract is to be terminated. If you want to terminate the contract, how much notice you have to provide. If the other party wants to terminate, how much notice they have to provide. In some contracts, they speak to the remedies that are available if there is a breach. In some contracts, it tells you what the penalty is if there is a breach. And you know, in law, there is limitation as to when you can bring an action. And last but not least, if Tom, Jerry, and Sam enter into a contract, Mary cannot enforce that contract because she's not a party to the contract. And that's what you call privity of contract. Only persons who have signed onto that contract can enforce that contract. So now let's break it down a little bit more. Because when you speak about offer, you now need to relate this to when you are in a bank. Because that's what, when we come on Wednesday, we're gonna talk about how these contract terms can now be applied to banking. So an offer. An offer is a proposal or promise by one party to enter into a contract on terms with the intention to be bound as soon as the person to whom the promise is made indicates their acceptance. So an offer could be made to an individual, it could be made to a group of people, it could be made to the general public. An offer could be written or it can be implied. So when I put in here the names that you call it the offeror and the offeree. So when you talk about an offer, you have to distinguish between what is an actual offer and what is an invitation to treat. An invitation is to treat is someone asking you to come in and negotiate for the purchase or sale of an item. But they're not willing to be bound by the terms of the invitation. So this is normally what happens when you, have, you go to a shop, they have an item in the window and they have a price on it and they say $400. Then they have something else in the window and there's a price on it. That is not an offer. That is an invitation to treat. They're asking you to come in. Most times you'll hear them say, oh, we don't have any more like that, but we have some that's similar to it. The price is a little bit higher. So that was what we call an invitation to treat, for you to come in and start negotiations. So the distinction between an offer and an invitation to treat usually requires one to consider the communication between the parties and to try and ascertain the intention with which a statement was made. Remember in law, everything goes to the state of mind, your intention. Always remember that. There are no emotions involved in law. Everything is based on the facts. What was said, by words, 
and what was done by words or by action. An offer can be revoked at any time. But when you revoke the offer, the, the revocation has to be made to the person to whom you made the offer to. The offerer can revoke it himself or he can use an agent to communicate his revocation. So let's just say you have a car you want to sell. Doris wants to sell her car to Waltine. So she says to her, I have a car for sale. Or she puts a sign up, $500. What's that, um, um, Doris? You have a car and you have for sale five hundred dollars. What is that? Is that an offer? That's a cue. Um, that's a that's <laughs> a, that's an invitation to treat. That's an invitation to treat. <laughs> right? Yes, you're right. Okay. So then, as Waltine now comes and she tells you she'll buy it for you for from you for four fifty. But she'll let you know, she let you know by Wednesday. What is that? That's a counter offer. That's a counter offer, yes. That's a counter offer. That's a counter offer. But she said she let you know by Wednesday. Right. Mm -hmm. And you're getting the feel for how the question will be on Wednesday, right? Mm -hmm. You're getting there. You're getting there. Mm -hmm. So an offer lapses after a period of time set or established within the offer. So let's just say she'd come and look at the car. You say, on the car's for sale for $500. Um, if you're interested, you'd need to let me know by 12 noon on Wednesday. So at 12.01, the offer lapses. Mm -hmm. If the offer or the offeree dies before the offer is accepted, the notice of death terminates the offer. Once an offer is rejected, it cannot be accepted. Rejection may be a simple no or decline or a counter offer. An offer may be made, an offer may be made to the public like rewards, like when they put the sign up on, on, on saying a um, missing dog, a reward of $500, that's an offer to the public. I have a question. Uh, go ahead. We talked about, well, I mean, talked about, um, it's not so much an offer. Let's say you're in a car accident with a person and you decide to work it out between yourself um, and the person goes missing and you would have taken them before the court. Do you have a case? If they said to you, I'm going to fix your car for you, mm -hmm. and then they go, go, you can't find them anymore, they disappear, you decide then to take them to court. Is there a case? But you, okay, you say you can't find them anymore, so how are you taking the case to court? They are, okay, that is true. But let's just say they are no longer. Agreement. You found them and they say that, in agreement, okay. right? The previous contract that you the verbal contract that you may have. Okay, okay, so stop right there, stop right there, stop right there. Now, here, what you say now, you said the verbal contract, right? This is this is how this is how I want you to start to think now. What are the elements of a contract? When you say that word contract in law, that means something. That it's means an that it, there's an offer, it. uh huh, consideration, consideration right. an intention to be bound, right, and, and they had the legal capacity, right. So I okay. To them. So there was an offer; mm -hmm. it was accepted. Mm -hmm. The consideration was the figure that you all agreed on. Now, did they intend to create legal relations? Were they serious? 
they would have appeared to have been at that time because they would have given me their contact information. Okay. And they were of legal age. Yeah. Okay. So now you before now you before you before the magistrate. Right. And those are the elements. Those are the elements that the that the magistrate wants to hear. The party agreed on such and such a day after the accident that they would repair my car at this cost upon the, the um, submission by me of three estimates of which so they would the person, choose. So where the person denies that claim, what does the magistrate base that decision on? If it was only oral. The agreement was the oral. intention of the parties. Okay. Based upon based upon based upon your dialogue with the with the magistrate and their dialogue with the magistrate, he will come to the inclusion whether those elements of a contract was arrived at. It doesn't have to be in writing. Okay. The same elements apply whether it's oral or it's written. So there was an offer, there was an acceptance. The consideration was he was to pay you the money. And paying you the money would have been based on you sending in the quotations to them for the mm -hmm. cost for it to be repaired, if that was a condition. Then when he listened to what, what you say was what the next person says, were they did they really intend to enter into a contractual agreement to have this done? Okay. Because at the end of the day, when you didn't hear both sides, most likely the judge will say, Okay, so an agreement was formed. What are you going to do now? How are you going to pay? Or he'd turn to you and say, well, let's just say you never mentioned that you had to get quotation. Let's say you didn't, that wasn't a part of it. You all just agreed. The judge will now turn to you and say, did you provide any quotations? Right. Did you, did you go and give it to the gentleman or the lady? How much time lapsed between there? See, they're not interested, they're not interested in, in, in how you feel, whether he was going to row. Um, they're not interested in that. Did you get quotations? When did you get it? When did you give it to them? Mm -hmm. What did they say after that? That's what they're going to look at. Okay. okay. Okay? So always remember that. Don't get all emotional. You have to stick to law. So acceptance, you have to accept the offer while it's still open. So let's just say the same person now who had agreed with you said, but I'm traveling at the end of the month because I work on the out island or I'm traveling at the end of the month of graduation. So if you agree, if you agree that you want me to fix your car, let me know by Friday because I'm traveling. So you being your slowful self, you try to reach him the following Monday. His office is gone. You understand now? Yes. Mm -hmm. Okay. Be mindful of that too. If someone tell you that you if you want if you want this done, this is the time frame, you have to do it within that time frame. And acceptance, if the person accepts it, let's just say that you say, okay. It cost me 500. Here's the quotation. Their acceptance to doing this has to be unequivocal and absolute. They can't be wavering. They can't be saying, man, I, 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 that sounds like a lot of money. I, they don't accept it. You need a clear acceptance. No conditions attached. Acceptance may be by conduct or by words. Now, it could be the other way around where you say 500 is fine, go ahead. So you go ahead and you get it done. And now it's time to pay the mechanic. Again, the court will look at, did, was the acceptance unequivocal? Was the response given to you, the authority for you to proceed? 
Acceptance must be communicated to the offeror. You can't give it to someone else. So let's, let's say you went, it was driving the car with the husband. You knock on the door, his wife is there. Wrong person. Always make sure you're speaking with the party involved. Now there are exceptions to the rule. If the offeror sets out his own method for communication of acceptance, you have to follow the method that they indicate. If they, if, if they told you after the accident that from here on, anything we communicate must be in writing, then you need to follow it. If they say email me, then you email. Don't send text message, because that's not what was agreed. Of course, when it's business, you have the postal rule. And the postal rule means that once it is stamped and you have the correct address, then that is the date that you use. And then if you say you posted it, you have to prove that you did so. Consideration is money, or what we call in kind is either given or is promised or done in exchange for something else. So each party undertake to discharge a certain legal obligation under the contract. And that has some value in exchange. So if you look at your, if you look at your employment contract, what's the consideration? You work. An employer pays you, correct? Yeah. Okay. So there are some legal considerations when it comes to consideration. Past consideration is no consideration under the law, which means that if you're entering a contract, you don't refer to some monies that you were given that you gave a long time ago. It has to be now in the present. A promise to perform an existing duty or obligation to the promise is not consideration. Any promise you made to a third party, that again is not consideration because a third party can't enforce a contract. Promises, of course, such as, oh, I love you, or I, I always like you, that is not consideration. So always remember, if you enter into an arrangement with your brother or your sister or your mother or your daddy, remember familial relations in law, those are called domestic relations. And the court doesn't look at those as having an intention to create a legal relations because you're family. Why does the court kind of take so long with divorce situation? What you mean? Ancillary matters. Why does divorces two and three years long here in the Bahamas or longer? It depends on the parties. Don't sound so. It's not like it depends on the court. But it, if you see, it would appear as if the court would prefer that the parties themselves try and work it out, give them enough time to try and work it out, seek counseling and that kind of thing, as opposed to allowing two people to make a decision that they come to an agreement at a one time and say, okay, boom, we're gonna deal with this today or this month or this year and get this done with. Why okay, do we have so, for years, so, so, years? Okay. so you're looking at two different systems. If you, look at, if you look at the way divorces are done in other jurisdictions, they have the no fault. The no fault jurisdiction is no one is pointing the finger at nobody else. We just, we just don't want to be together anymore. Right. You file for divorce and then you amicably sit across the table and you divide your assets. Here in the Bahamas, when you file for divorce, you file for divorce based on fault. Mm -hmm. So you have to bring your evidence as to whether it's desertion or whether it's cruelty. When you finish with that part, 
before you even get to talking about the ancillary part, which is trying to deal with distribution of the assets, the court is going to send you to reconciliation. They're not going to give you divorce just like that. They're going to ask you to go for counseling. So that's our, because of our jurisdiction. That's, our, that's for our jurisdiction. You will go for counseling. They're trying to keep marriages together. A healthy marriage with children in it gives you a better society. And sometimes, because I've seen it where a husband and wife come back after, and one party wants to remain in the marriage, they will ask the court for more time, more counseling, with the hope that the other party will change their mind. That's one side of it. So let's just say you get the divorce now. Now it's time for ancillary. Each party has to go and write down their income and their expenses. Here comes the argument part now. One party is going to leave out some income. One party is going to pad the expenses. Uh -huh. And so that is back and forth and back and forth, back and forth. Oh, you forgot this. No, no, no. No, I don't have this anymore. Oh, no, no, no. Oh, he went and he sold this. Oh, no, no. He went and put all of these um, 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 assets in a company. So you're going back and forth. That's, that's, and that's where it comes in. And then after, after you've done the whole listing of your income and expenses on both sides, then you all have to decide, he's going to have to decide whether he's going to give you maintenance. Or he may decide he's not giving maintenance and you now want to argue before the court that you are entitled to maintenance and this is what you want. And he's telling you he can't afford it. Wow. The, another thing could be, let's say you had the children, four children in QC. Now that you all are divorcing, right? Already divorced now. He's writing all of his expense. He's no longer in a matrimonial home. He now has to find someplace else to live. His rent is X amount of dollars. You always sharing a car. He needs to buy a car. He can't afford for the children to be in that school. He's now asking the judge if the children can be put in a less expensive school to accommodate him in order for him to live. There's a lot of different reasons why it take a long time. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Didn't know that. So you have to take all those things in consideration when you enter into a relationship. And you intertwine things. You have to think about what happens if there is a disagreement. What happens if we split? What happens if we separate? Who is paying what? Who can pay for what? Who will be saddled with what? We have to think of those things. Mm -hmm. Who's spending the most on maintaining the house? Who's spending the most on whatever? They get a higher share. So when you say maintenance, maintenance is not, that's not mandatory. That's like alimony, right? The earlier maintenance, yes. But alimony care is not mandatory. It's not a given. No, you have to you have to ask for that. Okay. Yeah, you have to ask for that. And that has to be something that you were already used to and already receiving in most instances. So if you if if he always paid for you um to get your hair done on a monthly basis, he said, This five hundred dollars is for you. <laughs> Every time you would go to a ball, he would give you a brand new dress. He, he, would, he would actually take care of you. Then you start arguing for that. In most instances now, the men now are asking for the children to come with them. So they have to give you nothing. Wow. They keep the matrimonial home and they keep the children. They may decide to give you something every month if you're not working. But instead of having to give you tuition, giving you money for... Um, summer camps giving you money for clothes and maintenance of the children and you calling all the time they just keep the children themselves okay mm -hmm. no emotions remember that <laughs> all right so they must have intention to create legal relation that's a mind thing 
The next thing is they must have capacity. So to enter in a contract, capacity means they must have sound mind. And they must have the authority to enter into a contract. Capacity also means that they must own whatever it is, whatever the contract is about. So let's say the car we were talking about. To sell it, you have to own it. Or the power to enter into contract, such as a principal or you'll be an agent. A minor, anyone under the, anyone under the age of 18 is a minor. But a minor can enter into contracts for what we call necessities. So if a minor is in school, and let's say he went to a boarding school, he can enter into a contract with a shop to buy a coat, to buy boots, um, scarf, tam. He can do that. Those are called necessities. And he can select what he wants based upon his statue in life. If he is wealthy, he can create an account at Macy's or Saks. If he is poor, then it is expected that he can go and create a, an account at a, at a less expensive store and enter into a contract. Have packing boys entered into some kind of contract? They keep coming up. I had another class that's asking the same thing. Don't forget now, the Employment Act does allow them to work if they fall within the age bracket as stipulated by law. Now, I don't know whether um, they actually have a formal contract, but I do know for them to be on the premises and to actually pack, they have to be within the ambit of the Employment Act. Okay. Right. Now, a minor can also enter into an employment contract as an apprentice. So let's say he's learning how to do woodwork or plumbing with someone else, he could enter into a contract because that's for, for learning a skill. Someone who is mentally incapacitated or someone who is drunk, we recall is they have restricted capacity. And which means that sometimes as someone who is like a drunk or who is a drug addict, sometimes they do have lucid moments. And when they are lucid, they can enter into a contract. So a contract is valid, or it could be void, or it could be voidable. Valid means that all the elements are there. Void means that it lacks some of the essential elements of a contract. And voidable means that it can be voided, which means it can be canceled. So sometimes like when you're in the bank, you, if you know your customer, you know when your customer themselves, whatever transaction they're doing, they have the capacity to do it. So by now in this age, you should be able to tell someone who is intoxicated or someone who is high on drugs. You should also know someone who is under what we call undue influence, which means that there's someone else pressuring them either to withdraw funds or to enter into a loan. So a contract can be discharged in four ways. The parties could agree to discharge the contract. Or based on the contract, the parties have performed the act that they said they were going to do. They've done all the obligations and the contract is finished. Or a contract can be discharged if there is a breach, which means that there's something within the contract 
that one party did not do. And so the person who is aggrieved is the person who's going to sue. A contract can also be discharged when it is frustrated. And this is where one party to the agreement is incapable of going any further or cannot perform their side of the agreement. And so what they say that is, is deemed to be discharge due to the frustration. So a frustration could be death, a frustration could be a hurricane, an earthquake, anything, or maybe as let's say a strike that can frustrate a contract. So say if you had a contract and your contract was, you're going to deliver um, two truckloads of cement. And the contract says that you will deliver it on Monday by three o'clock. What happened on Monday morning? There's a strike. No, 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 no drivers are, are moving any trucks. They're doing a demonstration because they want the roads to be paved or they want something changed. That means that the contract that that trucking company has with that company is frustrated. Now, of course, there are remedies when there is a breach. And remember, when you talk about a breach of a contract, it's either a breach of the term of the contract or someone did something and the contract cannot continue. And remedies to breach are in common law and there's also equitable principles. Remember, equ equity means fair and just. So under common law, anyone who's aggrieved under contract, they could ask for damages. They could ask for an agreed sum or they could ask for as much as it is worth. Equitable remedies are always discretionary. It's up to the court. And you could only get an equitable remedy where the common law remedy is not adequate enough. So under equity, you can ask for specific performance. So this means that you're gonna ask the court to tell the other party, you agreed to do this and it must be done. Or you can, the court can say, guess what? Let's stop this where this is right now. That's an injunction. Or the court can say, guess what? Let's bring this contract to an end and put the parties back where they were originally before the contract was entered into. All what the court can do is just correct the mistake and that's rectification. So, A valid contract must be formed as an agreement implying an offer and an acceptance which was intended to create legal relations for consideration. So I want us to look at the law of contract and its relevance to banking now. A contract is an agreement which legally binds the parties to it. How is that relevant to banking? A contract is an agreement which legally binds the parties to it. How is that relevant to banking? It is relevant because I mean, every, because we enter into contracts with persons all the time. I mean, it's just it's so exactly. Easy. Okay, you're right. So under the law of contract, it is an agreement which legally binds the parties to it. It's relevant to banking because a bank has more than one contract 
with each and every one of his customers. Under the law of contract, the parties agree to be bound when there has been an offer which has been accepted. The relevance to banking is banks must be careful to ensure that advertisements and information leaflets do not constitute the open offers which can be accepted by anyone. How does a bank make an offer? How does a bank advertise? Marketing through um, the media, news media, well, uh huh. By media, marketing to media, um, we post signs and ranch externally. Um, we we are in ourselves as, as employers. We also do local marketing, um, phone marketing. There's a lot of different ways. Okay. So, okay. So listen now. Under the law of contract, parties agree to be bound when there has been an offer which has been accepted. Mm -hmm. In banking, you have to be careful when you advertise. Okay, let's say these, um, these mortgage advertisements mm -hmm. where, where the bank will offer a rate. And we do know that, and we do know that, that, rate is not, that rate is not offered to every client that comes in. Right. Okay, so that's why I'm saying, under the law, under the law of contract, you know that once you make an offer and that offer accepted, you are bound by that. But the relevance to banking is, in banking, you have to be a little bit more careful when you advertise. Yes, yeah, you always put that restrictions may apply part. Exactly. Now you get this. Yes. Because sometimes the offer is not an open offer. Right. You have to come and sit down and negotiate. Okay. So you get two rights so far. <laughs> now, when you see it on the midterm, don't tell me you don't know what it is. <laughs> Third, a contract is a bargain. Each party must give and receive something as consideration. Remember, that's the third element now, consideration. How is that relevant to banking? Well, when you enter into a contract with me to, let's say, fund you a car, then you mm -hmm. know that um, in exchange for me giving you this money in your hand, this one time, you're going to have to give me interest. Yes. In exchange for that. So that's mm -hmm. the contract we enter into. All right. So now you've gotten three out of three. So a contract is a bargain and each party must give and receive something as consideration. The relevance to banking is the bank provides services such as granting a loan and the customers pay the interest, any charges or any fees. And, and on top of that, now remember, a customer allowed the bank to use their funds for lending, right. their deposit. Okay, so now you get three out of three. Let's move on. <laughs> the parties to a contract must intend to be legally bound by its terms. Remember that? Yeah. The parties must have the intent for legal relation. How is that relevant to banking? The parties must have intent to be legally bound by the terms. Is that the part where they sign? Uh-huh. So, so if, you, if you want to open an account with me, um, you can tell me what your needs are and I, I, I devise this account for you. I offer you this particular type of account and you, I let you know what the, the account details are. You agree and you, you solidify that by signing off on it. Okay. So from the banking side, that intent to be legally bound is when the customer signs the contract and any amendments to it. Right. Okay. So that is their intent to be legally bound. 
That is why when customers come and start asking questions, and, and normally with, with the, but the banking side, customer services, well, you know, it's there, you know, and, and, and it's just there in paragraph so and so, but they never read it. That's right. When you sign that contract, that's, that is that part of the, on the contract law of your intent for legal relations. So we know all about offer. We know about acceptance. We know all about consideration. And now we're talking about intent to be legally bound. So let's go to the fifth thing. The contract terms may be expressed by the parties or they may be implied by law. How is that relevant to banking? Contract terms may be expressed by the parties or they may be implied by law. How is that relevant? Be expressed by the parties or implied by law. Implied by law? It, yes, implied by law. Okay. How is that relevant to banking? Okay, but we talk about banking principles being based based on law. Based on contract right. law, yes. Right, based on contract law. So I, I when you say maybe express, I guess you could say they, they could be written down based in, in some kind of booklet, pamphlet kind of thing, um, an agreement that's mm -hmm. documented about the way the manner in which the account will be operated. And of course, these will have to be based on principles that are, that come from law that are legal, legal and binding. So that if anything were to happen, any questions, any issues, um, they can be dealt with based on legal rendering or based on the law Principal okay so right so let me let me make it let me make it less cloudy let me make it less cloudy for you so the contract terms may be expressed by the parties or they may be implied by law which we agree like when we was talking about selling the car right right so under banking law banking law their terms are some of them are within the contract itself but some of them are based on common law. The things that a bank done is based on common law, case law. What, what, what they're trying to do now as we move into, into this new electronic age is try to take some of these terms and actually put it in the contracts. So normally the term, yes. So normally the terms of the contract, all of it is not written within the four corners. A lot of it is based on case law. Okay, that makes sense. Okay. Now, and on the last one is under the law of contract. Most contracts need not be in any particular form. How is that relevant to banking? Remember not all contracts don't have to be in a particular form. If you're selling property, that has to be in a particular form. If you're selling a car, the only thing you really want to have on it is and in your agreement for sale is that it has the VIN number of the car. And of course you have to sign over the, the decals, but now you use the certificate of title. So most contracts need not be in any particular form. How is that relevant to banking? Um, most contracts need not be in a particular form. I mean, we have so many, I guess, because we have so many products and services to offer that we couldn't, we, we could not write any documentation to pertain to any one particular product or service. We write broadly and the principle covers everything, I guess, yes. right, for operations and credit. Right, so, you, so, so you've gotten it right. In that the relevance to banking is, with banking, all of the products that it offers to its customers, because of the nature of its business, it's in writing. 
You want a mortgage? That's in writing. You're giving a, a um, promissory note? It's in writing. You're asking for a loan? It's in writing. You're giving a guarantee? It's in writing. So in contract law, everything doesn't have to be in a particular form. But in banking law, it is in a particular form. Okay. It is. That's the difference between banking and contract law. In banking, it is written. It is written. So, what we're going to do on Wednesday, we're going to do a contract case itself. We're going to do a question with a car, which is easier. People could, could, could relate to that. We'll answer that one on a car. And then we're going to start the banker customer relationship. And Walton, you did that very well in extrapolating from contract law to banking law. And so let's see when we're in class on Wednesday with everybody else. I'll let you not answer. I'll let you answer last. <laughs> then, no, 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 because I want to see if they got, grasp the concept of when we start talking about the banker customer relationship. Because the banker customer relationship is fundamental to everything you do in banking. As a banker, you must know the banker customer relationship and you also have to know that duty of confidentiality. They are critical to knowing what banking is all about. So for those who, who haven't read chapters two and three, read it again. The first thing we're gonna do Wednesday night is a question. Then we're gonna go into chapter four and we're gonna look at chapter four. We're gonna read it. Um, I'm gonna send to you, I won't send it to you tonight since you have Wednesday class. I'll send after Wednesday the case I want you all to read, the Bahamian case over the weekend. And of course, you have Monday as a holiday, so I won't see you until next Wednesday in class. So we're going to go to chapter four. There are going to be some cases in here, and I'm going to ask you all to, for homework again for next Wednesday to look at some of those cases online. So if you have any questions or you want to discuss it. Any questions? No. no. Okay, so I kept my word. It is 7:40. <laughs> I tell you, I keep my word. I, right? I, I have a I do have a question not related to what you just said. I just wanted okay. to know is do you have did did I miss it, but did we get your like contact information, email, any of those things? Oh no, you didn't get that yet. You'll get that Wednesday. Oh, okay. Why well, you want me to give it to you now? <laughs> I guess if um, I see if I, on Venice, I put it on the board, it'd be easier. Up to you. You want it now? I can get it now. I, I need, yes, please. <laughs> CM, CM Archer underscore UWI at yahoo.com. Okay, got it. Oh, got it? Okay. You need the number two? Sure. No. What do you mean, sure? <laughs> you offered. Yeah. No, I know, I know. Like sometimes people um running late or, I don't know, may have an emergency. Like my last class had death in the family and stuff like that, so... Someone asked you a WhatsApp group. That's not you, eh? No, you can do a WhatsApp group if you want to. Up to you or you can let me know. You all sure you don't want to do you don't want to do a research question? No, sir. <laughs> you mean as the midterm? No. Not as anything. 
as one of the final exam questions? Uh, one of it? No, ma'am. Yeah, as one. No. Okay. No, thanks. That's the accent, you know. Yeah, I know, because it's seven weeks. It'll take too much of your time. Hey, didn't you all have some homework? Someone was supposed to tell me about Gulf Union Bank. What happened? Listen, the only thing I think I got, I, I, didn't, I didn't look that up. I was looking at the Central Bank Reserve thing, and I don't know if I didn't look that up. Vanna State and Vanna State, Vanna State. Gulf Union Bank, okay. Vanna oh, State, I, I, have, I, I have something not as related to the Gulf Union Bank, but remember we were talking about the domain accounts? Yes, yeah. yes. On Wednesday so, then. Will you tell me now? I can wait on Wednesday. I can wait on Wednesday. Okay. So the dominant account, the central bank reserve, someone's supposed to do Gulf Union Bank. Okay. Okay. And don't forget, we'll stick to our time, so be prepared. Okay. Okay. All right. So see you all on Wednesday. Okay. Six o'clock sharp. Good night. Good night. Good night. Good night. Okay. Okay. All right. Bye. What you saying, Cam? <laughs>